Amen. All right, Luke chapter 1 this morning, Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll be looking at verses 39 through 55. But we're going to focus most of our attention on Mary's song 46 through, through 56. So uh, if you haven't gotten one, Christopher is passing around a copy of, of Mary's song because we're going to sing it at the end. I mentioned a few moments ago, if we're going to we're going to study Mary's song, we need to sing Mary's song. So we'll do that towards the end. I need to keep an eye on my clock so that we stop with enough time. So make sure everyone or at least couples get a get a copy of that. All right, Luke chapter one. <clears throat> And we're going to read verses 39 through 56. So this is, uh, we talked a little bit about this in our uh, four weeks in John, that Luke is unique uh, in some ways. Of course, John is is unique among all the gospel writers and how he begins. Uh, but Luke really has some of the oldest, you know, the in terms of the, the material related to uh, the, the New Testament era really begins with Luke, and that is with a focus on John the Baptist. We find in, in chapter one, uh, the birth of Jesus foretold to Mary in the sec, sort of the second section of chapter one. And then we're going to pick up with Mary's visit to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. And then we're going to focus our attention specifically on Mary's song. So we're looking at two Two of the songs, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, from the Nativity narratives of Luke this week and next week. Okay, so Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is he, blessed is she, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and return to her home. All right, so uh, this verses forty six through fifty five, as I mentioned, uh, really is one is a song. It's a poem, uh, and often this will be described as Mary's Magnificat. Now, why would why would this be described as Mary's Magnificat? Where do we get that word from? Any ideas? Okay, so it's the it's literally the first word in in Greek is the word translated here in verse forty six magnifies. Magnificat is the Latin translation of the Greek term, but you can hear obviously our English term magnify comes from that Latin term, and so this has come to be called just sort of in church tradition the Magnificat or Mary's Magnificat, and this is one of four what are sometimes called Lucan canticles or nativity canticles. Four songs in Luke's gospel that are unique to Luke's gospel. Luke records them and nobody else does. And so we're going to look at two of them, one today and one, one next week. But there really are four. Uh, Mary's Magnificat is one of them. The second one is uh, uh, Zechariah's song. Look at verse 68 of 
uh, Luke chapter 1. Zechariah, this is after John the Baptist is born and Zechariah receives his speech again. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit and it's a prophetic song. And verse 68 begins with the word, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So this that song is often called the Benedictus, which again is just the Latin translation of that word for blessed. Then the third song is in Luke chapter 2, which uh, we probably will be hearing about tonight, and we, we sing about it in the season, and that is Luke chapter 2, verse 14, and this is the song of whom? Luke 2, 14. Who sings this song? The angels, right? Yep. And so uh, the, what's the first word of the song? Glory, right? And so, yeah, this is the Gloria, which again is just the Latin word for the first word of this song. And then the fourth song is uh, begins in verse 29 of chapter 2, and this is the song of whom? Simeon. And uh, if you look, Lord, now are you letting your servant depart? That word depart, uh, depart in peace, is actually the beginning of the song in Greek. And in Latin, it's nunc dimittis. And so that's what this, that song is often called. So you've got four Lucan canticles, the Magnificat, the Benedictus, the Gloria, and the Nucdimitus. These became some of the earliest hymns that the Christian church sang, which makes sense, right? The early church continued to sing Old Testament psalms, of course. They began to write new Christological hymns, and we even have some of those in our New Testament, like Ephesians chapter 1, Philippians uh, 2. There are several um, passages in the New Testament that are very clearly in a sort of poetic form that were likely early Christian hymns. But some of the earliest Christian hymns that it would have been very natural for uh, the Christian churches to sing were these Lucan canticles. And so we're going to focus our attention on just two of them uh, this week and next week. And this week, of course, is Mary's Magnificat. So she begins this song, again, with this idea of magnifying the Lord. We'll talk more about that. And then sort of the second phrase of the opening of her song, the first line of verse 47, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And as we're going to see, really, that's what this song is all about. It's about, it's about magnifying God. And in particular, it's an expression of joy and praise to the Lord. Notice this is, if, if, as we read through it, this is not a prayer. It, it doesn't include any requests. She's not asking God for anything, right? Rather, this is an exaltation. This is a magnification of God. This is an expression of, of the joy that she is experiencing because of everything that's happening to her, and in particular because of what happens in this meeting with Elizabeth. And that's really going to be the focus of, of our, our attention this morning is, is why. Why is she expressing joy? What creates this joy? Uh, and what's the relationship even to us today? You know, there's a lot of talk about joy today amongst Christians, like what is joy? How should we express joy in, in these sorts of things? And as we know, in a lot of Christian circles, the joy that is attempted to, you know, be produced maybe in worship services is more of a kind of manufactured joy. It's sort of a, um, a manipulated joy or sort of a surface level happiness. And unfortunately, that often describes a lot of Christians, right, where maybe we have a veneer of happiness on the external, but there's a lot of Christians who actually internally are not happy people. They're, they're suffering you know, maybe there maybe there's reason for that. They are experiencing sufferings or various trials, uh, and so they're not actually experiencing joy. And that's certainly true of the unbelieving people of our age, who are, uh, you know, we see more and more anger and um, dissatisfaction with life and a lack of joy that really sort of permeates our society. And so this is a, this is a message that we need to hear. And of course, th at this time of year, there's often a focus on joy, joy to the world, the Lord has come. And all the Christmas carols that even unbelieving people, you know, hear in the mall, hear at Chick-fil-A, hear, you know, here and there, and even sing, maybe Christmas carols or whatever. And yet there's not true joy. And so Focusing on the, the root causes of Mary's joy, what she is experiencing, I think is a lesson that we as believers need to hear, but certainly unbelievers as well uh, need to hear uh, too. So the question is why? 
right? That's what, that's the question I want to begin with. Why is she expressing joy? Why, what causes her to break forth in song? And a, a song that magnifies the Lord and that allows her to express the joy of her spirit. Well, that's why we read the context first. We're going to get to the song itself, but we need to go back and look to what precedes the song and led to Mary breaking forth in the song. So what happens here in the narrative, right? We've, we've already, pre previous to this, Zechariah had been told by the angel in the temple. Remember that story in, in the beginning of Luke that John the Baptist would be born? We talked about that a little bit when we talked about John in uh, John 1. And uh, and he becomes mute, right? Because he, he doesn't quite believe that his barren wife, I mean, who is older, this is probably an older cousin, perhaps even an aunt, but an older cousin of Mary. Mary is a very young girl, um, of course, a virgin and not even married yet, or just now, you know, in the, in the process of marriage. Uh, but Elizabeth is old and barren, and yet there's this prophecy, you're going to have a son, and not only is, or to, to Zechariah, your wife's going to have a son, not only that, this is going to be the son prophesied who will be one like Elijah who will prepare the way for Messiah. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. So he doesn't quite believe it, he's mute because of it, but we have that prophecy. So now Elizabeth is with a uh, child, and Mary, in the uh, beginning of verse 26, receives a visit from the angel who proclaims to her that she will bear the Messiah, Jesus, and she actually believes, and that's going to become key in what we see this morning. She says, you know, at the end of uh, verse 38, Mary says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord, let it, let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed. So she doesn't have the same problem as Zechariah, she, she believes the Lord. And so then we find in our text here now that Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth, and what happens immediately as she enters the dwelling place of Elizabeth and greets her. What happens? The baby, the baby leaps in her womb, right? So, I mean, this is not the focus of our lesson, but just pause for a moment and think about the implications of what that means, right? For just understanding what is it in the, the womb of a woman? Is this a, a pre-human? Is this just a, a fetus? Is this just a clump of cells? No, this is a human being. Only human beings can leap for joy, right? From the moment of conception, we have a human being, and that's what we have here with John. And John, of course, because he is this special anointed one of the Lord who will prepare the way for Messiah, when he, even in the womb, when he is in the presence of the Messiah, who's not even been born yet, who is, it has merely been conceived within Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, John leaps for joy, that then indicates to his mother and helps her understand what it is that she is encountering here in, in the very womb of Mary. And so we find that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, so she is, she's given that special insight. And what does she say to Mary? She says, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And it's not just this general blessing and, oh, I'm so happy you're pregnant. She clearly knows what's going on because of what she says in verse 43. And why is this granted to me that the, notice this phrase, the mother of my Lord should come to me. So does Elizabeth know who is growing in Mary's womb? Absolutely. It's her Lord, right? And then she, so we have this, this joy of John at the, at the presence of the Messiah, even before he is born joy of Elizabeth, and then Elizabeth proclaims this blessing upon Mary in verse 45, and blessed is she, so he's talking, she's talking about Mary, but the question is, why is she proclaiming a blessing upon Mary? Okay, this is going to become key for even what we see in Mary's song. Just notice, is, is, does she say, blessed is Mary because Mary conceived the Messiah and is bearing the Son of God. Does she say that? No. Blessed is she. Why? Because Mary believed that there would be a fulfillment of what is spoken by the Lord. So why, why is it that uh, Elizabeth is proclaiming a blessing upon Mary? It's because Mary, which we just read a moment ago, believed, believed that what the Lord had promised would truly come to pass. 
And that that helps us to understand, too, why Luke is even recording this song. Because it helped because when we consider the record of this song, and of course, all of the narratives in Luke, in light of what Luke himself says is the purpose of the book, it connects directly to this blessing upon Mary that Elizabeth is proclaiming because of her belief. Just turn, uh, you know, probably one page. Look at Luke chapter one and verse four. Luke clearly gives the sort of thesis or purpose of his book. Uh, you, if you remember, who is who is Luke writing to? Theophilus, uh, who is clearly a Greek by his name. We don't know exactly who he is. He, you know, it, some some think he's an unbeliever, and Luke, in both his Gospel and Acts, is trying to convince him. But others believe that that Theophilus is actually a Gentile convert, and Luke is writing to notice verse four. He's writing so that you might have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Why, why is Luke writing the entire gospel? It's so that Theophilus, and by extension, anybody who reads the gospel, including us today, will have certainty that what we have been taught is actually true. There's a definite connection between Luke's purpose and John's purpose that we saw uh, as well, right? So this belief that Mary expressed which is the reason for Elizabeth's blessing upon her, is exactly why Luke is writing the, the gospel in the first place. He wants us to believe like Mary. And notice, he doesn't, he doesn't just say in chapter 1, verse 4, that you might believe. What's the language he uses? That you might have certainty, which is the essence of true saving faith and belief. Right? Belief is not just, oh yeah, I kind of think that happened, or oh yeah, I think, I hope that, the promises of the Lord will be actually fulfilled. No, true belief, the kind of belief that Mary clearly had, the kind of belief that caused Elizabeth to bless Mary is a belief that has certainty in the promises of God, which is exactly what Elizabeth says. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Yeah. And I, don't, I always think that when, I know Mary believed from the very beginning. Yeah. The confirmation from Elizabeth that she sure. knew already. Yeah, and you know, absolutely. When right. she came into her presence, mm -hmm. it was confirmation for her. Right. I am preparing <laughs> to save you. Absolutely, yeah. So this further confirmed what she already accepted when, the, yes. when Gabriel told her the message. Absolutely, right. So so this is the key, right? And this, this will lead us into really looking at Mary's song. What is it that produces the joy in Mary that leads to her bursting forth in song. It's belief, right? Certainty in the promises of God. Belief that what God says is true. This connects, of course, directly to our study in Hebrews right now in chapter 11, right? All of those people in that hall of faith are people who believed. And what's been the emphasis as we've looked in that chapter? Did they have physical proof or evidence for their belief? No. In each of their cases, they had to simply accept by faith, right? Faith is the assurance of things not seen, but because they had faith, because they believed in the promises of God, that gave them a confident, certain joy, even when there maybe from all earthly perspective might have been no reason to have that sort of certainty and joy. Yeah, Tom. But in, in fairness, Mary had evidence, Right, exactly. Yeah. So there there was, that's true, right. But 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 she still had to believe it that was it was so, right? Oh, sure. She still had to have faith, and that's exactly why she's been blessed. Okay, so that leads us directly here to to the song. Why what what did Mary believe that that was resulting in Elizabeth's blessing upon her? And that would result in the joy that would burst forth in, um, in in this song. Uh, just by way of introduction, Luther has this has a great sort of comment about this belief of Mary, which really is the focus. Uh, Luther at one point said there really are three miracles of the nativity: the incarnation itself, right, the Son of God taking on flesh. That's a miracle. The virgin conception, 
which is really how we should describe it, right? It's not just a virgin birth, it's a virgin conception, right? No, it is also a virgin birth. Uh, that's a miracle. But the third miracle Luther notes is Mary's faith. Because here's the thing. I mean, it is true. She did have physical proof. But think about all the people during Jesus's lifetime who had a whole lot of physical proof and yet did not believe, right? In fact, if you remember, remember the rich man and Lazarus and that whole, that whole account, and the rich man goes to hell and he asks Abraham, please send Lazarus back to my brothers, because if a guy comes back from the dead, they're going to they're gonna believe. And what does Abraham say? Not necessarily, right? If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, if they don't believe the word of God, they're not going to believe even if someone comes back from the dead. Even physical evidence does not produce saving faith. What is required to produce saving faith? <clears throat> What's that? A miracle of God, right? So Luther's right. There's three miracles. The incarnation itself, the virgin conception, and the fact that Mary actually believed. This is a God-wrought faith. And the, the fact of the matter is, then, the joy that is produced in Mary because of her belief is actually a further evidence of the belief. Right? The scripture teaches this. Uh, and this connects directly to some of the things we talked about this, the last several weeks with regarding the nature of saving faith the nature of belief. How do we know that we have believed? Here's one of the ways that you can know you believed. If, if you have joy in believing, if that belief, if that faith, that certainty in the promises of God produces joy, that is confirmation of true saving faith. Christians should not be grumpy, right? Now we get, we get upset about things and people have different personalities and dispositions, but that that should not be a characteristic of who you are, right? People with true saving faith, people who believe the promises of God are joyful people. My soul rejoices, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That's, that's a measure of genuine faith, okay? So what is it that produces the kind of joy that Mary experiences here and, and expresses through this song? Certain faith in the promises of God, okay? So then the next question is, well, what did she believe? What is it that she believed that uh, that led to that joy? And that's really the content of her song. I want to begin looking at her song with just a couple broad observations about the song itself, and then we'll look at particulars of what of, of what she said. First of all, Mary's Magnificat is saturated with scripture. In fact, as you read through it, it almost sounds like a psalm, doesn't it? I mean, we just looked at the Psalms, you know, for 15 weeks in the spring. It, 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 it sort of feels like a Psalm. It sounds like it could, she could have taken it right out of the Psalms. Well, why is that? It's because almost every line either alludes to a passage of Old Testament scripture, or in some cases, directly quotes from passages of Old Testament scripture. This, this song is saturated with scripture. Let's just run, let me just run through some of these here. <laughs> Uh, verse 46, even how she opens the song, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That Those two lines are taken almost directly from Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Hannah being the mother of Samuel. And you remember that, that story is very similar to what's going on here with both Elizabeth and Mary. Two women who should not have been able to bear sons who are, by the miraculous work of the Lord, carrying sons. Same thing with Hannah, remember, who was barren, who went to the temple, prayed and asked the Lord for a son. God granted her request in the person of Samuel, that great prophet. And 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, And Hannah prayed to the Lord, My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. You can see Mary is taking those lines very clearly alluding to those lines of Hannah in the opening of her song. Verse 47 uh, alludes to particular uh, statements from Habakkuk 3.18, where the prophet says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Mary is, is drawing directly from that language. Verse 48 of Mary's song is taken directly 
from or at least alluding to language in Psalm 138, verse 6. For though the Lord is high, he regards the, low, the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. And there's actually that kind of language is used in several different Psalms. Verse 49 alludes to statements from Psalm 89 and Psalm 71. Verse 50, which we'll look at more closely in a moment, is a direct quotation almost. Well, we'll notice one uh, interpretive change in verse 50 uh, from Psalm 103, almost direct quotation. Verse 51 alludes to Psalm 89. Verses 52 and 53 of Mary's song, again, are taken from Hannah's song in 1 Samuel. And then verse 53, the first line directly quotes from Psalm 107, verse 9. I mean, so every line of Mary's song is either alluding to or directly quoting from Old Testament scripture. This song is thoroughly scriptural, which is the mark of any good song, any good Christian song, any good expression of, uh, of Christian faith that we, that we ought to sing. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we studied the Psalms. You know, we, I think we ought to sing the Psalms. But I don't, I'm not one who would argue that we can only sing the psalms. I think we ought to be writing and singing new songs. But even the new songs that we write and sing should be fully and thoroughly saturated with what? Scripture, right? The best hymns that have endured the test of time and the best hymns written today that I believe will endure the test of time are hymns like this, where Almost every line is an allusion to or using the language of or the imagery of or the poetry of inspired scripture. I mean, you think about, you know, what one of the best Christmas carols that there are, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, is one of those hymns, right? Where every line you can point to particular statements in scripture that, that Wesley is poetically embodying in this poetry of his hymn. Were you going to say something, Ed? I was going to say that if you think about Mary <clears throat> saying these things, talks about her upbringing, about how she was steeped Absolutely. in scripture all her life. It just didn't pop into her head. Yep. Uh, it's it's something that comes out of us if we're in the scripture. Absolutely. Then that 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 was that was exactly the next point I was going to focus our attention on. Oh, this is great, right? How, how is it that she knew so much scripture? that she could just burst forth in song. I mean, there, there very likely is clearly some Holy Spirit inspiration that is happening here. But nevertheless, remember, inspiration is not that some person falls into this trance and just mindlessly, you know, don't, don't think like the pagans think, where, where the, you know, the medium of the deity just en empties their mind and then the God speaks through it. It's not like demon possession, right? No, with inspiration... The author of scripture, or perhaps in this case, Mary, in speaking this song, if she is inspired or if what she's saying is inspired, it's still her own words and it's still based on her own knowledge. Luke is a perfect example of that. We believe that the gospel of Luke and that, and that Acts are inspired scripture, right? Every word is exactly what God intended for him to write. But how did, how did Luke write his gospel and Acts? He conducted interviews, he did research, he traveled around, he collected information, and then he put it together, and what he, what he, was, what he was writing was inspired scripture. The same is true with Mary. Yes, it, it may have been inspired, but nevertheless, she had to know that scripture in order for it to come out of her mouth. This, this is not like direct prophecy, it's rather inspiration. Yeah. yeah being saved out of the Roman Catholic background, you thought Mary was a sinless queen of heaven. Yeah. And then when you read this, the joke is a God that saved you. But well, you're, don't get ahead of me. Don't get ahead of me. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, good. All right. No, this is great. Okay, but just... Yeah, great. So, but just to make the point, right, that, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons she... Number one, believe in the promises of God. You have to know the promises of God in order to believe them. And number two, what brought her joy is that she knew the word of God. Like if, if you don't have joy, if you're like, why am I always grumpy? Why am I, I mean, maybe part of it is that you're not in the word enough, right? She, she was clearly immersed in the word. She clearly, I mean, she's a young girl. She clearly had parents that raised her to know the word, uh, a synagogue tradition, a, a worshiping community that that helped her to know the word and that is what enabled her to pen this beautiful uh beautiful psalm of praise in the lord okay so uh 
So she believed and is filled with scripture. Now, the other the other big observation is to ask the question, okay, so what, what is her focus here uh, in this song? We've already pointed out that it's not a prayer of petitions, but rather, what, what is the focus? Did you notice a two-word uh, phrase that appears over and over and over and over again in this song? Look at verse 48. For he has... Right? Verse 49, he who is mighty has. Verse 50, his mercy is. Verse 51, he has. Second line, he has. Verse 52, he has. Verse 53, he has. This Verse 54, he has. What's the repeated phrase? He has, right? This is not, and this is, this is another mark of a good hymn and a mark of a good expression of joy. This is not really a song about her. It's not really a song about her joy, although it is an expression of joy. And there's a lot of worship songs today that are all about joy. And it's like, I'm so happy, me, 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 my joy, my joy, my joy, my joy. This is an expression of joy, but what is the focus of the song? He has, he has, he has, he has. It's the reasons for the joy. And who is the he in this song? What's that? Okay, the Lord God specifically, and I, I raise this because is this song about Jesus? It's actually not, which is surprising, right? Because this is all about Jesus. She's bearing the very Son of God. But it's not yet about what Jesus is going to do. This is about what God the Father has done. He has, he has, he has. This is about what God has done, which then she is believing in and causing her to break forth in joy. Again, you've got to know what God has done in order to experience this kind of joy. Okay, so what has God done then? We're sort of moving through these series of questions. What has God done that Mary believes, which then brings her joy? Okay, now we're going to actually look at the song uh, in, in a little more detail. Look first at the first uh, section of the psalm, uh, the song, verses 46 through 49. Okay, verses 46 6 to 49 marks the first section of the song. And if you had to characterize what her focus is or, or what, what category of works of God that she relates in these verses, how might you categorize it? And let me, let me just point out a couple phrases that will lead us there. For example, my soul, verse 47, my spirit, verse 48, he has looked on the humble state of his servant. Who's that referred to? Who's the servant she's referring to? Herself. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me in holy name. Okay, so what is the focus of the works of the Lord in these verses, in this first section? What God has done for, for her, specifically for Mary. Right, her personal experience of what God has done. That's that's her focus in these first couple of verses. And th this is important, right? Because we have to believe not just that some general things happened, but that those things happened for me, right? Their personal faith, personal trust. We can believe, yeah, Jesus was born, he lived, he died uh, for people's sins. A lot of people believe that. And don't experience the joy of saving faith because they don't believe that that happened for them, right? So where this starts is important. She believes in what God has done personally for her. But let's dig into that a little bit more. What has God done specifically for her in these verses? Now, what might we, what, what might we expect her to focus on? We might expect her to focus on the virgin conception. But is that what she focuses on? She's not saying, my spirit rejoices in me because the Holy Spirit conceived the Son of God within me. She doesn't say that. She might have focused on the fact that she gets to be the mother of the Messiah. But is that what she focuses on? No. Which is interesting and very important because, you know, verse 48, the second half, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. So here's a question for you. Are you are you uneasy with that? Are you uneasy with calling Mary blessed? No. 
Now, what might tempt us to be uneasy about that? Yeah. Roman Catholicism, right? Where they, I mean, they're they're very uh, adamant that we ought to call her blessed, right? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Right? That's the beginning of the of the Hail Mary prayer. Is there any problem with that first half of the prayer? It's the second half that's the problem, right? Holy Mother, <laughs> Mother of God, which that's a that's an unfortunate phrase, although I won't get into it, but that phrase, Mother of God, Theotokos, actually began as a defense of the deity of Jesus. And you know, when, when the deity of Jesus was being um questioned and his you know deity humanity sort of questioning that, which we talked about in John uh, one. Uh, people use the language, well, no, here is Mary, a human mother, who is the mother of God. Therefore, what we have here is a is a, is a a divine human in Jesus Christ. But eventually, that phrase, mother of God, came to mean something much more heretical, right? Uh, and then, pray for us sinners. What? Praying to Mary to pray for us. You know, so that's the problem, right? The problem is not calling Mary blessed. Because again, why are we calling Mary blessed? We actually, this phrase, uh, uh, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, is not, we're not calling her blessed because of the virgin conception. And we're not even calling her blessed because she's the mother of the son of God. Why are we calling her blessed? Okay. Okay. Luke answers this, and actually Jesus himself answers this very directly. Uh, we don't have time to turn there and spend a whole lot of, a whole lot of time here, but later look at Luke chapter 11, verses 28, 27, and 28. If you remember that narrative, a woman comes to Jesus and says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. In other, word, in other words, bless Mary. Okay, well, so that fits with this statement in, in verse uh, 48, right? But what does Jesus reply? He's, he, he doesn't disagree with that. But he says, blessed are all those who hear the word of God and keep it. So he's in a sense saying, yes, bless my mother, but don't bless her because of the virgin conception. Don't bless her because she is my mother. Bless her because she believed. And what's the implication? You too can be blessed if you believe. Verse 47, and my spirit is in God and my Savior. Exactly. Okay, good. So Lou brought this up a moment, moment again, too, and this is exactly the moment to talk about that. She's, she's not uniquely blessed because of anything special in her. She's uniquely blessed because she believed in the promises of God. And, verse 47, she trusted in God as her Savior. Right. So this is no holy mother of, of Jesus. This is not, there was no immaculate conception, right? Which is the doctrine that when she was, when she was conceived in her mother's womb, she was conceived without sin. No, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that Mary needed a savior. And the reason that she is blessed is because she actually trusted in God as her savior. Augustine said, Mary was more blessed in accepting the faith of Christ than in conceiving the flesh of Christ. It could have been very possible that Mary could have conceived the Son of God, bore the Son of God, died, and gone to hell, and never been blessed. The reason she was blessed was not that she bore the Son of God. The reason that she blessed was that she trusted in the Son of God for her salvation. So, so here's the implication then. Is the blessing that Mary experienced, and therefore the joy that Mary experienced, unique to her? Or is it something that we also can have? It is, right? We can experience the same kind of blessing. What's that? In other words, the Lord had four knowledge. If Mary would take this word, I think there was something about it. Um, <laughs> follow your plan to me. Right. As opposed to how Elizabeth does it said, Certainly, right. So, and then that, I mean, certainly Mary's faith is was, was part of the purpose and plans of God, right? But my point is, she's not she's not experiencing the blessing of salvation or the blessing of the joy of this song merely because she bore the flesh of the Son of God. 
She's experiencing these blessings because she believed, which yes, absolutely was part of the purpose and plans of God. So Scott, yeah. when, when Paul in 1 Corinthians writes, or considering her calling for others, he says, God chose what's low and despised in the world. You know, here's a, a humble servant. Right. I'm nobody as far as the world is concerned. I'm just this girl yep. from a little town. And he chose me. And then Paul refers to a similar situation to the Corinthians. So exact. So you all are getting ahead of me, which is great, <laughs> because this is exactly the case, right? What Mary says about herself is actually not unique. The fact that she is low and God is using her and 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 uh, um, and and done great things for her, right? That's true of her personally, but it's actually not just unique to her because the Scripture actually describes that is the case for all of us who believe and experience the salvation of the Lord. And we'll get, and, and that, that comes to play in the song here in a moment. But note, notice now verse 50, because this is the turning point of the song. So she's just talked about what she has experienced personally, which have we, as, as we've seen really is not necessarily unique. Now, of course, the virgin conception is unique and bearing the son of God is unique. That's all unique. But the, but the saving blessings that she's experiencing is not unique. And verse 50 makes this clear. Notice what she says. And his mercy is for all who fear him from generation to generation. So she has just talked about the mercy that she has experienced, which is very much the case. God has taken someone lowly and has done great things for her. But verse 50, and she's quoting here from Psalm 103, directly quoting, verse, verse 50 is a, is a hinge point to say what I have experienced can be experienced by anyone who has this condition, that they fear him, which is just a, a flip side of, of the saving faith that she is experiencing. She's quoting Psalm 103, but actually, under the inspiration of the Spirit, she changes one thing. Psalm 103 says his mercy endures from everlasting to everlasting, which is true, but that's sort of an of an impersonal way of describing the mercy of God, right? His mercy endures forever. Okay, that's true, but moved by the Holy Spirit here, Elizabeth changes it and personalizes it, right? It's not just that his mercy endures forever, like it's this sort of abstract thing that's just hanging out there in eternity. No, his mercy endures for people, right? For those who fear him, from generation to generation. And again, the reason for that is she's really connecting her own personal experience to extend it to anyone who believes just like she did. It's true for anyone who fears the Lord from generation to generation. Okay, so what 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 is it that is true then of God's mercy? What is this great work that God has done certainly for Mary, but also has done for all those who fear him. Well, that's the rest of, of the song. We find here these, these amazing reversals that connects to directly this idea that the, the lowly becoming great is not something unique to Mary. Notice uh, verse 51. Uh, he's shown strength. He scatters the proud, right? Those who are proud, he makes low. He brings the mighty from their thrones. So he takes people who seem great and he pulls them down. And who is it that he lifts up? Well, people of lowly state, like Mary, things of humble, uh, those of humble state, verse 52. Notice the reversal in, in verse 53. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sends away empty. Right? So we have all these reversals, and it's exactly what we just mentioned. It's Mary's way of saying what I have experienced, someone of lowly estate being exalted, is true of everyone who believes. All who believe are exalted when we, we really, in and of ourselves, don't deserve it at all. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Good. Okay, then the last two verses, now finally, I mean, all of it up to this point has been has been somewhat general, right? God, God lifting up the lowly, God's, God's salvation, God's doing mighty works. 
But now she's specifically bringing the focus into the incarnation. I want to move this quickly so we have time to sing, sing Mary's song. Notice what she says here. We, we have the, the final he has. He has helped. He has helped who? His servant Israel. Now pause for a moment. To whom is, is Luke writing? This letter? Or this, this gospel? Theophilus. Is Theophilus a Jew? No. No. Uh, he's writing this by extension to us. Any Jews in here? So God has helped Israel. Why would that cause Theophilus to have certainty? Why would that cause Theophilus to have joy? Why would that cause us to have joy? Keep reading. Uh, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and his offspring forever. So he's he's even you know doubling down on this, or she is. That these promises that she believed in, that she's experiencing, and that are available for anyone who fears are promises made to Israel, to Abraham, and his offspring forever. So we may be tempted to think, well, that narrows the focus until we remember something very important. And in the providence of God, I mean, this is exactly what we're, what we're going to be studying in Genesis, in, you know, beginning in two weeks when we continue up with Genesis chapter 12. The focus is here is on the Abrahamic covenant. And God did give specific blessings to the nation of Israel, to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. He gave special blessings to the nation of Israel here in the Gospels, right, in sending the Messiah to them. And in fact, if you remember, Jesus himself said, I have come to, to the, the house of Israel. You remember, remember the narrative where a Gentile, um, uh, uh, literally a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus and begs him, please heal my daughter. And he says, I, I've come to the house of Israel. I've not come to anybody else. So there's, there's a sense in which that's true. But then do you remember what happens next? The woman begs, she begs, she begs. She says, even the dogs get the scraps. And what is Jesus' reply? His reply is, oh, you of great faith, and then he heals her daughter. What happens there is exactly what's happening in this song. The promises that Mary is experiencing personally are available to all who believe. And in the same way, the promises made specifically to Abraham and his offspring forever are available to all who believe, right? And I mean, this is embedded in the Abrahamic covenant itself, where God says, I will bless you, and I will bless your children and children and children and children and children, and through you, who will be blessed? All the families, All the families of the earth, right? Those, those who believe. We don't have, I wanted to look at Romans chapter 15, because Paul makes this explicit. We don't have time, because I want, I, want, I want to sing Mary's song here, if you want to go ahead and get it out. Hopefully we can sing this with even sort of greater understanding now that we've had a chance to look at it. But in Romans chapter 15, Paul makes that clear that Messiah came to be a servant to Israel, but then also he came that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And so what we find in this song is that the joy and the salvation that Mary experienced, that in many cases, of course, was unique to her in bearing the very Son of God, is a joy and a salvation that can be true for all who believe. This is available to anyone who believes in the promises of God and in God as the Savior. Okay, so let's sing Mary's song together. Uh, we sang this last Sunday. This this tune should be familiar to you from a, a hymn that we learned last Easter. Um, but let's sing this now with understanding. This is a, a very good. Any other, Christopher, any other copies? Or are they all gone? Let's, uh, anybody mute me one? Great. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's sing this with understanding now that we've had a chance to look at it. My soul now magnifies the Lord. My spirit shall in God rejoice. My humble state he did regard. Exalting me by gracious choice. Henceforth shall people call me blessed for the great things he has done for me. 
The mighty God is now my guest. The Holy One has set me free. His mercy is on all who fear, who trust in him from age to age. His arm of strength to all is near, the proud he scattered, though they rage. He brings down rulers from their seats and raises those of low degree. He fills the hungry souls with meat, the rich depart in poverty. He helped his servant Israel, remembering his eternal grace. As from of old he did foretell to Abraham and all his race. So praise with me the Holy One who comes in all humility. To our Redeemer, God's own Son, be glory in eternity. Amen. And I love how the poet uh, put that last stanza. It's almost as if Mary is saying, so come praise with me, right? Which is exactly the point. We can praise and pray every one of the words of Mary because they can be as true for us as they are for her. And they are true for us if we believe just like she did. Wonderful truth. Let's pray together. Father, we do give you praise for the sending of your son. We give you praise that you fulfilled all of the promises concerning that first coming and his life and death and burial and resurrection and ascension. And we praise you that those who believe can receive your mercy and can find your salvation and can experience the same kind of joy that Elizabeth and John the Baptist in the womb and Mary herself experienced. We thank you for this day and tomorrow when we can really focus on and express that joy to you. And thanks because of the coming of our Savior. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.